Good evening and welcome to DTV, Community Television for Public Service to Knoxville and Knox County. I'm Knoxville's Vice Mayor Gwen McKenzie and 6th District City Council Representative and I will be your host this evening. My guests are pioneers of the civil rights years in Knoxville and Knox County and continue to be actively engaged in social and racial justice causes in our county and city today. I welcome living legends here, Dr. Theodis Robinson Jr. and Mr. Robert J. Booker. Mr. Robinson, uh, if you could please start with just giving the audience uh, a high level overview of your resume here in Knoxville and Knox County Public Service. I was raised in Knoxville, although I was born in Chattanooga. My parents moved here when I was two or three years old, went to the public schools here, became involved in the lawsuit to desegregate the Knoxville City Schools in the fall of 1959, was involved in lunch counter sit-in demonstrations that uh, Mr. Booker inspired all of us to become involved in. In the summer of 1960, I sent a letter of application to the University of Tennessee to enroll in their undergraduate school. And that led to a number of things happening because at that point, UT did not accept black students in their undergraduate school. And so my letter requesting enrollment led to a series of events uh, where ultimately I was admitted to UT and attended school there. Following my time at UT, I ran for the seat that Vice Mayor McKenzie now holds, the 6th District City Council meeting, uh, or 6th or District City Council District. Uh, when I finished my service on the City Council, I became Vice President for Economic Development for the 1982 World's Fair. When that was over, I went to work at UT, subsequently being named Vice President for Equity and Diversity for the UT system. And now I'm retired and busy. I write a political opinion column for the Knoxville News Sentinel, which gives me a, really, a real opportunity to vent some of my frustrations at the politics in our land. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Booker, would you please give us an overview of your resume, please? Yes, I was born in Knoxville and went all through grade school, junior high, high school in Knoxville. And then I attended Knoxville College after I'd spent three years in the Army. I was involved in organizing the sit-in movement as a student at Knoxville College to help to segregate lunch counters in downtown movie theaters. I got involved in politics and was elected to the state legislature for three terms. I ran for mayor of Knoxville in 1971 and lost, but was appointed administrative assistant to the mayor of Knoxville. I also write a weekly column for the Knoxville News Sentinel that I call a reminiscence and, and history column, where I like to think about the good old days and where I do research and talk about historical events in this city. Thank you. And thank you both for your service. So this evening, we're going to have a conversation around urban renewal. And so if you both will, uh, just talk a little bit about uh, what were you doing? Where were, were you serving? And what was the climate, uh, political as well as community climate, uh, at the beginning of urban renewal and that conversation about urban renewal? Uh, Dr. Robinson, we'll start with you. To my knowledge, the first urban renewal project was the construction of the Knoxville Auditorium Coliseum, uh, which took my family's home. I lived on a street uh, called Acres Place, which was just the southern extension of Patton Street. And once you cross Church Street, it became Acres Place. And right about where the steps are located, on the east side of that building where you would go into the ticket window, that's about where our house sat. Uh, they took that property to build that. My parents then moved into East Knox County where I was in high school at that point. Then after I got elected to the city council and I was aware of urban renewal projects that had happened before over in what they used to call the bottom uh, an area that often would flood for taking that land. I'm not certain, 
but I was on the city council when the Morningside Urban Renewal Program uh, came along. What was done in Morningside was very different from the way it had operated in the other earlier uh, urban renewal programs in that uh, one result of that one was the construction of 200 uh, standard brick homes that were designed, first of all, for people who would otherwise rent in the projects or who had been displaced to live in those homes with the option being to buy. And it differed in another aspect. Previous urban renewal programs simply paid a grant program. A survey was done of the Knoxville housing market, and we're talking 1970 here. Uh, so they did uh, surveys of what it cost for a standard one bedroom, two bedroom, three and four bedroom homes. So that a family, let's say hypothetically, you've got a couple that have a son and a daughter and they require a three bedroom house, but their property was appraised at 10,000 when the Knoxville market showed that to buy a standard house in that 25, oh, in that range for a three bedroom house was $25,000. KCDC, which was the implementing agency, would write two checks, one for the $10,000 to buy the property, and the second was a $15,000 grant, given that that's what it would require to replace their home. And so that family just uh, gained $15,000 in equity that they previously didn't have. Good. And that's a fact that we don't hear talked about very often in the conversation around urban renewal. So thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, Mr. Booker, uh, same question. Uh, what were you doing during this particular time frame and what was your uh, assessment of the political and the temperature in the community at that time? Well, I, I lived down in the bottom when the first urban renewal project took place, which was called the Willow Avenue Project. And many of the houses in my section of town were substandard. We had a lot of people who had outhouses. We didn't have hot and cold running water in those structures. It was a place where First Creek had its way after a heavy snow or a heavy rain and flooded people out. So certainly urban renewal was, was necessary in that area. But what bothered me about urban renewal was that it went too far. It took too many black businesses by my count, at least 107 of them were destroyed. It took 14 black churches uh, that, that had to leave the area. And as uh, Dr. Robinson has said, people were not given replacement value for their properties they were given fair market value, which was certainly not enough. I know one case in particular that will give you an example of what I'm talking about. There was a service station in the downtown area. The housing authority offered the owner $35,000. He went to court. The court awarded him $60,000, but it still was not enough to relocate. So that to me is one of the major problems of urban renewal. We lost all of those businesses because we weren't adequately compensated for them. And not only that, there was no place for them to move to have a viable business. Thank you. And so I think that what we're hearing is that there were some, you know, there was some need for improvements in some areas of the community that was uh, displaced during urban renewal, but sounds like the more uh, most devastating part was to the black businesses that, yes, were, so that me, were located. Let me interject to you. Uh, uh, Mr. Booker was talking about the climate in the community as it related to urban renewal. Mm -hmm. after, the, after the Auditorium Coliseum project and then the Willow uh, Street project that uh, uh, Mr. Booker just referred to, there was the Mountain View project. And I'm not certain how many urban renewal projects that, that had been had, but there was, after those experiences, a very negative attitude 
towards urban uh, renewal programs because of the fact that it never paid replacement value for anything that it took. And so Morningside, even though it was different in that regard, as I recall, uh, there was a grant program available for businesses that had to relocate that was a $50,000 cap as far as grants for businesses. I know on the home ownership side, uh, there was up to $25,000 in grants available. And then if that didn't uh, close the gap, then there were low interest loans, particularly as when it came down to home renovation, because not all of the homes were taken based on the condition of the, of the housing structure itself. Uh, there was one gentleman who grew up on the, on the street where I did on Acres Place, who bought a house right at the corner of Surrey Road and whatever that street is that runs right behind back, uh, Rudolph McCamey. And uh, I know he got uh, both a grant and a low interest loan to rehab his home. So it was the, the climate was very negative based on past experiences. And it was sometimes difficult for people to wrap their heads around that perhaps this might be a good thing. Okay. Were either of you serving uh, in office, in political offices during during the period of time with Urban Renewal? Well, let me say this, that there were four Urban Renewal projects. Two began at the same time, the Willow Avenue project, mm -hmm. which destroyed basically the black business community. The other was the Yale Avenue project, which worked in the UT area which in essence doubled the land size of the University of Tennessee. And of course, mm -hmm. we had the Morningside project and we had the Mountain View project. With regards to your question, I, Urban Renewal started about 1958 and I was elected to the legislature in 1966. Dr. Robinson was elected to city council in 1969. So I had seen what was happening with urban renewal before I went to the legislature. In fact, uh, I was hired by Mayor John Duncan as a city employee, and I was assigned to the urban renewal field office, which in the beginning was on Dahl Street, where they had begun to tear down housing to build Walter P. Taylor homes and we moved into a better facility on East Church uh, Street, uh, just across from Macmillan School, which was then the uh, Chancellor Branch YMCA. So I, I saw it up close, not only as a person who lived in the urban renewal area, but I came back and worked for almost two years as a relocation person in, in urban renewal. Okay, thank you. And so yeah. looking, looking and back, on the city uh, council, I'm sorry. I was on the city council when the Morningside Urban Renewal Project uh, began. I took office uh, January 1st of 1970 and close on the heels of that, Knoxville, well, the, back then I think it was called the Knoxville Housing Authority and they had someone to leave uh, KHA then hired Rodney Lawler, who headed that organization, and that was the implementing structure for the Morningside Urban Renewal Program. Looking back, how was the Civic Coliseum and the development in that area, how was it embraced during that time by the community? Was the community resistant? Uh, so if you'll take us back and just share a little bit about that. You, you know, I, I'm sure the others who lived in in that area has a, a take because he, he feels it deeply. But I, I didn't think about it from the standpoint of urban renewal and removing people from the area, but it was a facility that opened in 1961 on an integrated basis. And that was something we'd never heard of around here because at the time, we were downtown picketing the theaters and lunch counters trying to bring about the segregation. Chill How We Park, which was owned by the city, admitted Black people only on Thursdays. 
Uh, prior to 1958, Blacks could go there only on the 8th of August for our so-called Freedom Day. But uh, I noticed in the paper that the Coliseum was about to open, so I called the office and asked if there would be a section for Negroes. And they said, oh, no, we're going to open on a, uh, an integrated basis. So we were extremely delighted that something in East Knoxville was going to open to give us an opportunity to participate in, not only to see shows, but we would have a first class place to have dances and parties and whatever, because we were not admitted to the ballrooms at the Andrew Johnson and the uh, Farragut Hotel. We had to deal with the Cal Johnson Recreation Center. It was the only public place where we could uh, uh, go and have our social activities. Wow. That's interesting. Dr. Robinson, would you like to add anything to that? Well, <clears throat> my parents uh, evidently didn't have any problem with the taking of their property. Uh, the payment that the uh, city made for their property, they used that to buy two homes. Uh, not to pay them completely off, but to make down payments on them. Uh, so they acquired two properties, which they had to continue making payments on. And I remember distinctly that I've had several moves in my life from one place to another. That was the easiest move that uh, I ever was involved in. Uh, they came, the moving company came out uh, my parents and my sister and I had packed up our belongings. They loaded them into the truck and we moved into East Knox County in the area called High Top up off of Straw Plains Pike. And by evening time, everything was set up in that house. I've never had a move <laughs> that went as smoothly, but that had nothing to do really with the policy to take uh, our property to build the Coliseum Auditorium. And so very, very briefly, talk to me about what do you envision the Black community would have become or what would have become of it if it had not been for urban renewal? Well, you know, we were forced by law, state law and, and city ordinances to deal with ourselves, uh, except for the balcony at the Bijou, we couldn't go on Gay Street to a movie. We had to deal with the gym theater. We had to develop our own restaurants. We had to develop our own hotels and tourist homes. We had our own shoe shops. We had our dry cleaners. We had several taxi cab companies. And I would like to imagine today that those businesses were able to grow, that younger generations would have taken them over, and that we today would have a very prosperous Black community. But I, I don't know that we have that in comparison with what we used to have. Indeed, we do have black businesses today, but I, I don't think we, we have the real deep basic businesses that we used to have, except for the Jarnigan and Sun Mortuary. All the rest of them have gone. And then I wonder too, just what impact desegregation had on businesses. Uh, when the lunch counter sit-ins were going on in the summer of 1960, my parents uh, operated a restaurant there at Five Points, or the Five Point Restaurant. And most of our clientele, I would say 98% of our clientele was Black, uh, who came into our restaurant to eat. But with desegregation of restaurants and lunch counters, and I remember, for example, uh, when they opened the Greyhound bus station on Magnolia Avenue, many Black folk would go there uh, after church to eat. And the same thing was true at the airport. Uh, when it was desegregated, families would go out to the airport to eat. Those things tended to, and especially after the passage of the Civil Rights Act that uh, banned discrimination uh, in public services like restaurants, those things had an impact on our business. And things, you know, eventually the restaurant closed after 10 years of successful operation. So it was a mixture of what happened 
from a standpoint of urban renewal taking uh, businesses and uh, the desegregation of it. And you talk about climate. <clears throat> there was a fellow here named Tom Lovely who had served on the Knox County Commission. He had an electrical uh, contract in business and had been required to move at least twice. And he really was upset uh, with the notion of having to relocate his business again, so much so that he confronted Rodney Lawler in City Hall, pulled a gun on him and fired a shot past Rodney's oh head. Goodness. It's still embedded in the woodwork at what is now Lincoln Memorial, Lincoln Memorial University. I know that wow. uh, Mr. Booker recalls that incident as well, wow. but yeah, people were distraught over what had happened mm -hmm. to their businesses. Well, well the honest, that just so happens it was my office where that gunshot was fired. Uh, I was there the day when uh, Tom Lovely came by to talk with me and uh, Rod Lawler showed up later on and there was a heated discussion that I didn't want to be in the middle of, so I left my office. And as soon as I left my office, I heard the gunshot. And sure enough, for many years, that hole was in the wall in my office. And uh, the newspaper even took a picture of it. And speaking of your, your dad's restaurant, I remember it very well because that was where I had my first job in the eighth grade when it was Barnhart's Five Points Restaurant. And when Barnhart okay. left it, your dad took it over. And I had many dinners there. I would take KC students over there to eat. So you're exactly right. And, and not only that, I remember when I got out of the Army in 1957, I used a lot of my mustering out pay to go out to the airport to eat because it was the one white restaurant where we could eat in at uh, in this area at the Sky mm -hmm. Chef restaurant at the airport. And I spent all of my money taking my friends over there for lunch and dinner. So I, I just got a history lesson. I often wonder why uh, we, my dad would take us out, uh, out by the airport to eat dinner. And now I guess I understand as a little girl, I didn't understand that. So thank you for sharing that. So well, it, it uh, was, <laughs> it, it was on federal property, so they couldn't mm -hmm. discriminate there. Every other place in Knoxville was segregated, except for that mm -hmm. federal property, and that's why we could go there and eat. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. So uh, as we get ready to, to wrap up, uh, I'd like for, you, for both of you to share with us, uh, we know that there is a proposed uh, huge project coming to our city and county. Uh, that is going to be in the vicinity of where Black people lived during those days with urban renewal. And so I'd like for you to share with me uh, your, your thoughts about that project, the location, and uh, what you, you know, do you think that it would bring value or devalue? And so if you both would just share candidly uh, with me your thoughts around that, specifically due to the location and the history. Uh, Dr. Robinson. You know, interestingly enough, uh, on Sunday, my wife and I drove that area trying to see exactly where uh, that baseball stadium is going to be located. And I noticed that a lot of uh, deconstruction is occurring on it. That whole area today is light industrial. I did not see any housing for people other than what's being built down there uh, at the corner of uh, Central and Willow. You have those condos that are already up with some apartments being constructed immediately behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the baseball stadium is not going to take up that housing. It's basically, mm -hmm. like I said, uh, light industrial warehouses things of that nature that exist down there now. Um, overall, you know, people talk about and their various opinions as far as this proposed baseball stadium is concerned. Mm -hmm. And people wonder uh, whether it's going to be good or bad. Well, I guess my starting point is that in order for people to improve their lives and have better economic 
opportunities, there has to be economic activity occurring. There has to be growth going on in order to get a piece of uh, that pie. The pie has to be expanded in order for there to be more slices for people to take advantage of. And I think that there's a great potential for an economic benefit uh, that would come from that stadium being constructed. Knoxville sits, uh, is the market for that kind of activity or that potential activity. When you think about the entertainment that can occur uh, as a result of a 7,000 seat stadium with shows coming in and what have you, uh, the tourism potential is a, uh, the market for that is about a uh, 400 mile radius of Knoxville or the distance that people can cover in a day's drive. If it's done right, and if the venues are developed around the whole idea of entertainment, and I noticed that uh, in that joint city council county commission meeting, when Randy Boyd was speaking, he talked about uh, the possibility of Knoxville becoming a place for family reunions. Within that market area, if you think in terms of family reunions, you have tens of millions of Black folk. And I know Black people love to visit the Smokies. I've seen that when the Legislative Black Council used to exist and used to hold events in Pigeon Forge. And people would flock here from Memphis in order to go shopping in Pigeon Forge and to see the Smokies. So done right, that project has great potential of economic return. Thank you. Mr. Booker, your thoughts? Well, I grew up exactly one block from where that site is. I know it very well. Recently, I've driven around it in my car. I've gotten out of my car and I've walked that area. My church sat right in the middle of that. Tabernacle Baptist Church was on that site. So I'm quite familiar with it. And what I think about it is simply this, any black politician who runs for office, the first plank in his platform is jobs, jobs, jobs. Job. We've got to bring jobs to our community. And that stadium, that complex would hire groundskeepers, it would hire security people, it would hire ticket takers, it would hire people who work in concession stands. It would hire people in certain management. The, the sky is the limit what employment would be in that area with that new stadium. So I don't know how any black politician could open his mouth and say, I'm opposed to it because city government gets our tax money, but it doesn't hire anybody. County government gets our money, but there's a limit on the number of people they can hire. But certainly with city money and private money combined, my goodness, that stadium could be a boom for, for, for employment in this vicinity. Well, and that, and city and that would be a city and county uh, joint venture uh, partnership. So thank you both so much for your comments and for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us today. Uh, always a pleasure to be in your both of your company and to have you both uh, together th today has just been very exciting. So thank you both. And we want to thank everyone for watching today uh, and hearing this history of more to come. And please come back next week for another interesting discussion on DTV. Thank you and have a good evening.